coming. The house is prepared with twinkles and lights adding holiday flair. But something is missing. Oh, what could that be? If not stockings on chimneys or trinkets on trees? Who's causing this mischief? A villainous stooge. A who villain rogue masquerading as stooge. The series will hunt him. With you as a witness, we're going to find the blight that stole Christmas. All right, good morning, everybody. Wow. Hey, do me a favor. Give yourself a hand this morning. Amen. I'm telling you, you guys worship like you meant it this morning. Thank you for just filling this place with faith. And uh, this is a healing day today. I really believe that. I'm glad that you're here. Let me take a moment and welcome those of you that are watching online. And I not only want to welcome you, I want to challenge you. Don't get too comfortable. You know, it's easy when you're not in a church environment to get comfortable. You can still receive, but I, I want you to just press yourself a little bit to be intentional to what God wants to do right there in your life And we want you to just stay so connected with us today. Well, we're going to continue the series that we started a couple of weeks ago. Actually, last week, our Christmas series entitled The Blank That Stole Christmas. And each week, we are filling in the blank because there are a lot of things, if we let them, that will rob us of our Christmas joy or of the Christmas spirit or will take Christ right out of Christmas if we're not careful. And if you were here last week, we talked about the offense that stole Christmas. Now, just a quick question. How many of you had an opportunity to put that message into practice last week? Anybody anybody face offense, right? Maybe somebody cut you off in traffic, took your parking place, said your kid was ugly. I don't know. There's a lot of things that can happen. But here's what Jesus said. Don't be surprised. You're going to get offended. He said, offense is going to come, and when it comes, you got to manage it and overcome it. And how many know that's how you deal with offense? You recognize it, you deal with it, and then you overcome it. And so this morning, we're going to do part two in this series, and we're going to talk about the discouragement, the disappointment that stole Christmas. Now, here's the thing about disappointment. It doesn't just come at Christmas time. It comes all the time. But the point is, it just seems to be magnified at Christmas. It just seems to be bigger in our lives at Christmas. We, we feel it more, so to speak. While everybody else seemingly is having the perfect Christmas, we're not. I mean, you go on Facebook and social media and everybody's Christmas tree looks perfect. Their Christmas decorations look perfect. But trust me, that's not the way that it is. But there are disappointments that we face, and it's not just at Christmas, and it's not just Christmas disappointments. There may be people here this morning that you're disappointed with your marriage because maybe it's not where you thought it would be or it's not what you thought it would be, but the good news is God has a plan for your marriage even now. I don't know how far gone it is. I don't know how bad things are. I don't know how good things are, but God has a plan for your marriage. Listen, here's what I believe with my whole heart. God wants you to have a vibrant, romantic, sexy, come on, happy, growing, thriving marriage, and you can do it, and God will help you to do it. Amen. You may be disappointed at your job. You know, feel like you got passed over, that things aren't working the way that they should. You didn't get the bonus that you expected. But I'm telling you, God cares about your job as well. Or you may be disappointed in yourself. Come on, that's easy to get there. Something that you said, something that you did, a decision that you made. So it doesn't matter where we are. We just know that disappointments come. But God wants us to to help us to navigate those things that we're going through. So we're going to deal with that stuff today. And here's the thing about church. Sometimes when we come to church... We need to talk about stuff we don't want to talk about. In other words, not every service is going to be a happy, clappy Christian moment. Those are great times. Those are wonderful times. But there are times that we need to deal with stuff in our life. 
We need to have the hard conversations. We need to let God speak to us. We need to be willing to let the Holy Spirit make us uncomfortable because the truth of the matter is you're not here today because you're perfect. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you that. And if I'm the first one to ever tell you that, it's about time. Amen. We're not here today because we're perfect. We're here today because we know we need something in our life. We know that we need some areas of our life repaired. We, we, Jesus didn't say that the, that the church was a social club. He described the church as a place for the hurting people. That's why I say that today is a day of healing. I believe that God is going to do some healing in our lives. We, we are an unfinished work. So I want to begin with a scripture this morning out of the book of Ecclesiastes, talking about disappointment. And this is Solomon that is talking. And here's what he says. He said, so I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. In other words, Solomon said, I'm, I'm kind of a big deal. I'm the best that ever was. I'm the best king they've ever had. I've had greater success than anybody else, and I'm the smartest guy in the room. All my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. In other words, if I saw it and wanted it, I went out and got it. There was nothing in my life that if I desired it or that if I saw it that I couldn't have it. He goes on to say, I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. I lived a life of luxury. I lived a life of pleasure. I sampled everything. I tried everything. I'm not sure he was the smartest guy in the room after all. But he said, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. He goes on to say that even though I had everything, I did everything, I'm the smartest guy in the room, everything that I had and everything that I tried, trying to find pleasure out of those things, it was like chasing the wind. It was like following after the wind, trying to grab it in your hand and hold on to it. So there's a lesson that we can learn from everything that he went through. He was still disappointed. He was still not happy. Even though he had all of this stuff, he's saying all of these things, none of these things satisfied me. How many know this morning you can't spend yourself happy? How many of you would like to try? I'm just, just be honest, we're in church. <laughs> Let's just see if we can. Listen, happiness does not come from stuff. And happiness does not come from more stuff. But sometimes we think if I can get a little bit more or that next thing, this didn't make me happy, but that next thing surely is going to make me happy. I was doing some reading this week, and I found out that over 70%, 73% of people that win the lottery end up losing it, and oftentimes many of them commit suicide. So getting everything that you want isn't always something that you want. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. You, you can't spend yourself happy, but you can enjoy the stuff that you have. Amen. You may not have what this guy has, but just enjoy yourself so much it makes him question what he has. Just enjoy what God has given you because, listen, we are wealthier. We are more blessed than probably 80% of the world around us. So just enjoy the stuff that God has given you. Enjoy the stuff that God has blessed you with. The next scripture is in Luke chapter 12. And this is Jesus talking. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. And Jesus is saying the same thing, that life is more than things. Life is more than just having more things. You know, oftentimes, I like using this illustration because a lot of people look at life and they go through life with what I call the shopping cart attitude. That if I can just get more stuff in my cart... If I can just get a few more things, these next things are going to make me happy. There's so much more to life than just pushing your cart through life and trying to fill it up with everything. Anybody know what an adrenaline junkie is? If you've ever watched the X Games or the Red Bull uh, competitions, these are the guys that, that they are on a constant journey trying to find the next adrenaline rush. That means every time they do something, every time they do some sort of extreme sport, they've got to push the envelope just a little bit more. They've got to jump a little higher, fall a little further, go a little faster. 
because what they did last time doesn't satisfy them, and they're always looking for that next thing, thinking that's going to satisfy them. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Be satisfied. Learn to be content. It's not about the things that you're pursuing. It's about pursuing God. Let me just go ahead and say this. Whatever area of your life that you're not having success in, go ahead and put Jesus first in that area. That's why the Bible says that, that when you put God first, all of these other things are going to be added to you. In fact, in Matthew 6, look at this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things are going to fall into place. The only way you can really be successful and not be disappointed is to build a relationship with Christ. See, you can look successful and not be successful. You can have a lot of things, but a lot of things don't determine whether you're happy or even if you're successful. In Psalms uh, 37 here, we get the same message. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. What is he saying in that verse? Don't seek happiness, seek God. And Jesus had some things to say about seeking him. In fact, here's what he said. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not go hungry. And then he says, whoever drinks the water that I offer will never go thirsty. I'm the only thing that's going to satisfy. Let me ask this question. How desperately does a hungry man look for food? I mean, that is his focus. How desperately does a person that is needing water seek out water. It's all they think about. It's all they can focus on because they know that if they don't get it, they're not going to last very long. That's what he's saying about, about us needing to have a spiritual passion or passion for the things of God. It's real easy to get comfortable. It's real easy to get kind of lulled asleep. And he's saying in this, seek me with everything. So I went back and I begin to look through the Bible, and I begin to think about, I want to see some examples of what I call Bible passion so that I know where I'm at. I kind of want it to be a judge in my life. And here's some of the things I found out about passionate people in the Bible. First of all, there was Jacob. If you remember his story, here was a guy that wrestled all night with an angel. And he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Joseph wanted that blessing in his life. Joseph want, Jacob wanted that blessing in his life. Jacob wanted to be close to God. Jacob wanted to know what does God want for him. And so he was willing to wrestle all night. Elisha said, let's serve the God that answers by fire. He went up against the odds. He went up against 400 false prophets. And he said, God, more than anything, I want, I want them to see your fire. I want you to show yourself real. And then I love the example of David. David couldn't stand to see Goliath stand in the way of his God. He couldn't stand to see Goliath make fun of his God. He couldn't stand to see Goliath say that your God is nothing and I'm everything. And so with passion, he went forward and with courage fought the giant. So there's a list goes on and on. Jeremiah said, your word is like fire in my bones. Job, and remember Job, that everything in his life fell apart. Job's entire world just imploded. But listen to the statement that he made. Joseph, uh, Job didn't have it all together, but he said this. He said, God, even though you slay me, I'll serve you. It doesn't matter what happens in my life, God, I will never not serve you. There'll never be a time in my life, no matter how bad it gets, that I won't look to you and have faith in you. Paul in the New Testament said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And then there was this Paul and Silas. And remember, they were thrown in jail, not for doing anything wrong. They were thrown in jail for doing exactly what God told them to do. In fact, they were thrown into the bottom part of the jail, the worst part of the jail, and they were left there. And then it said at midnight, at the darkest hour of their life, they began to sing praises. They had the realization that this is a choice. We can stay here and be disappointed. We can stay here and, and, and stay at this level that we're at, or we can just go ahead and praise God. And when they began to praise God, listen, their praise shook heaven. And God opened the door and set them free. So that's what we're looking at. And I want you to listen to this statement. 
The degree to which you experience disappointment is in direct proportion to the amount of God you have in you. How quickly do you get discouraged? How quickly do you get disappointed? How low do you go when you hit a wall? How, how, how low do you let yourself fall? Because it is in direct proportion to God in you. In fact, do you know the word enthusiasm literally means God in you? Because it is, a, it is a gauge on our fuel tank, it is a gauge on our faith tank, that when I go through a storm, if God is still in me, I can even face the storm with enthusiasm because it means that God is in me. The devil has no problem defeating the believer that is easily disappointed. Jesus taught a parable about disappointment. Here's what he said. He spoke a parable and said, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. He was disappointed. And so he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look for three years. So he came and, and for three years, he's been wanting something from this tree. For three years, he's invested. For three years, he's kept this tree there. And for three years in a row, he's been disappointed. He's doing everything right. He's making sure that it gets all the right supplements. He's got someone there to take care of it. And I just, I'm just trying to make a point. Anybody ever been there? That I'm doing all the right things. I'm saying all the right things. I'm praying all the right prayers. I'm planting all the right seeds. I'm complimenting the pastor. I'm doing everything I know to do to get on God's good side and nothing is working. So he said, look, here's what I want to do. For three years, we've done this. I've come seeking fruit, and I have found nothing. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Why is it wasting space here? Get it out, put another one in that will produce. But he answered, he, this is the keeper. This is the guy that was responsible for this. But he answered and said, hold on, sir. Leave it alone this year also. And I highlighted those words because I think that is a word from God to someone this morning. That whatever you're going through and you're saying, I'm willing to call it quits. And I think the Spirit is God. I think the Spirit of God is saying to someone or maybe to a lot of us this morning, hold on, don't quit so fast. Don't throw in the towel so quickly. Don't walk away just yet. Let's do this one more year. How many know that 2020 has not been a good year? Am I safe to say that? It hasn't been a great year. But God is going to do something with that. In fact, listen to what this guy says. He says, leave it alone this year until I dig around it and fertilize it, and it bears fruit well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Now, the King James says he dunged it, and dung is just a nice word for poop, okay? I think it's safe to say that 2020 was a poop year. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a purpose, it doesn't mean that God isn't doing something out of that. It doesn't mean that God isn't getting ready to do something. In fact, let me say it this way. God has a purpose for the poop. I don't know that I've ever said that before. I don't know that I'll ever say it again, but there it is. God has a purpose for everything that you've gone through, the disappointment that you are facing today becomes the fertilizer that God is going to use to grow you. So what is coming out of 2020 is that God has been growing us. God has been maturing some things in us. I just simply see this next year as a year that we're going to produce because we have been sheltered for a year. While we were put away, while we felt like, man, this year is, is not, has not been my favorite year, God has been preparing something. God has been doing a work. God has been moving behind the scenes, and he is working. And I think it's for the church, but I think it's for the individual as well. I think there's some people that have gone through some things that this year you're going to take more territory. You're going to advance more spiritually than you ever have. You're going to experience success in areas of your life that you never have. I believe that 2021 is going to be something significant for the kingdom of God. 
Someone had sent me a, a, an article and, and reading in it. It said, I want you to, in this article, they said, I want you to think back that every time that God has sheltered someone from a situation, they came out on the other side, magnified, multiplied, and blessed. They told us that we needed to shelter. And every time that God has sheltered someone, when God sheltered Israel, they came out stronger. When God sheltered Moses for 40 years on the backside of the desert, he came out as an incredible leader. When God sheltered Paul and left him in the desert, Paul came out as an incredible theologian and leader of the faith. And any time that we've had to be been sheltered, any time that you are sheltered away, God is doing something on the inside of you. This has been a year of growth. You may not see it, but it's getting ready to bring forth. Give it one more year. Come on, believe God one more year. Trust God with that dream one more year. Put it out there and watch what happens this year. It's going to be something significant. So how, how do I deal with disappointment? Honestly, the Bible has a lot to say about it. I picked out a couple of things that I want to share with you this morning. And one of the things, dealing with disappointment, number one, you got to choose joy. Now, I'm not trying to play this down. I'm not trying to be too obvious, but I don't want you to miss how powerful this principle is, is that we choose joy. In fact, Philippians 4, verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. First of all, I get to choose joy. Joy is not always that feeling. In fact, joy is not a feeling. It is your foundation. Here's why you have to choose joy. Everything in your life flows out of your joy. Joy determines your success. Joy determines your attitude. Joy determines your health. A merry heart does good like a medicine. And joy determines your friends. If Listen, if you're a happy person, you're going to attract good people to you. If you're not, you won't. So everything in your life, joy, that's why it's so important that we choose it because it's not just an emotion. It is the foundation that we build from. Listen, choices lead and feelings follow. I may not feel joyful, but I choose, even though I don't feel it, I'm going to choose the joy of the Lord anyway, and I'm going to make my feelings catch up with that. So first of all, you choose joy, and then you have to choose it again. See, it's not, a, it's not a one time. It's not a one and done proposition. It's something you have to do day after day after day. And sometimes you got to choose joy several times the same day. You just got to say, I'm going to continue to walk this thing out. How many know that our happiness is not determined by our circumstances? It's determined by our choices. You got to choose joy. Don't worry. Let's talk about that for just a moment. Worry is allowing your mind to dwell on the potential negative outcomes beyond your control. Jesus says some things about worry. Let me read this. There's several scriptures here, but I didn't want to edit this out because I wanted you to hear everything Jesus said about this subject. Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Come on, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food, but God takes care of them. God feeds them. Are you not more valuable to God than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Worry doesn't make your life better. It doesn't make your life richer. It doesn't change anything. And why worry about your clothes? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work. They don't make clothing. And yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so much for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care about you. Why do you have so little faith? How many know that worry removes your faith? So here's what Jesus said. So don't worry. So don't worry about these things. Don't say, what will I eat? What will we drink? 
What are we going to wear? These things dominate the thoughts of the unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God. Above all else, live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow brings its own worries. Today is enough. So here's what Jesus said about worry. He says, first of all, worry is unnatural. It's unnatural in a couple of ways. Nature doesn't worry. I said it a few weeks ago. You ever seen a worried bird? They don't worry. They just know it's going to be there. God is so faithful in his provision. Worry is unnatural. Nature doesn't worry. God's got this. It's all under control. Second thing he said is that it's unhelpful. Worry doesn't help any situation that you're facing. Worry doesn't change anything. Does it make the situation better? Does it make you feel better? Does it make you happier? It drains energy out of you, and it breaks down your faith. It wears down your faith. So he said, don't worry because it's unnatural, it's unhelpful, and I'll just throw this in, it's unchristian. That's not something that believers do. We don't worry, we put our faith in God. Worry is a world thing, shouldn't be a church thing. Worry is something that the people that people in the world do, but people that have a loving, caring, heavenly Father that has never failed and never will fail, don't worry. Now, we may have to battle it. We may have to refuse to accept it. It's going to try to come, but we need to make sure that we make the decision. You know what? I'm not going to worry about it. And then last thing I want to tell you this morning and I think this is where God wants to kind of take charge of where we're going this morning. Don't hold on to your hurts. Don't hold on to your hurts. Because if you give God your hurts, God will give you his healing. But as long as you're holding those hurts, you're not going to experience the healing hand of God. So you got to let go so you can receive it. And I know that when we're wounded or, or when we're hurt, you kind of pull those things close and you guard them. And I feel like God is saying this morning to someone or to several this morning, if you let go of your hurts, he'll bring healing into your life. I want you to stand with me this morning. Disappointments are real. But what I want to do for the next few moments is I want us to invite God in to move in our lives. Not just a sermon today, not just some Bible principles, but an opportunity that we invite God to speak to us. And whatever in your life is hurting or whatever that disappointment is in your life, Today, and I feel the Spirit of God is challenging you to bring that to God. God, we take this moment that we realize the only one that can really fix what's wrong with me is you. The only one that can really heal the disappointments in my life, God, that's you. The only one that can get me past this place in my life, God, is you. God, my prayer as a pastor, my heart as a pastor, is that hurting people this morning will bring their brokenness to you for healing. Here's what I know. There are some people here this morning that are deeply wounded. I don't know why. I don't know all the details of your circumstance, but I know that you're deeply wounded and you're deeply hurt. 
I know you're disappointed, discouraged. But I know that today is significant and here's why. I'm not saying that you'll never think about what's going on in your life again. But there are some people here this morning that you need a starting point. There's some people here this morning that you need to bring that to God and say, God, today is the day that we partner together on this. I can't carry this hurt anymore. I don't wanna hold on to this hurt anymore. I need your healing. There may still be some tears to shed. There may still be some counseling that needs to take place. There may still be some storm you need to walk through. But today is significant because you're gonna give it to God. And you're not going to walk through it alone. And God's going to begin to bring peace and healing into your life. Just close your eyes for just a second. And just let the Spirit of God speak to you. Because if that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. One, because it's my heart. Two, because I believe that God answers prayer. But if you're wounded this morning, you're hurting this morning, I'm going to ask you in just a moment, would you step out? Would you come down here so I can pray with you? And would you bring your hurt with you with the expectation that I'm going to leave it here? And God, I'm going to lay it down because I don't need my hurt. I need your healing. So if that is you this morning, and it may take some courage but I know that you've got it within you. Will you come? Will you join? Will you bring your hurt this morning so that you can receive God's healing? If you don't want to come along, grab the person next to you and say, come on, let's go. They'll be glad to stand with you. Come on down. There's others this morning that say, I'm bringing my hurt. Because here's the thing. When I say that's not natural, you were never created by God to hold on to what you're holding on to. Even doctors will tell you, clinical doctors, psychiatrists will tell you, you hold on to the wounds, you hold on to the hurts, it'll destroy your health, it'll destroy your mental health. You are not designed by God to hold on to the wounds of life, to the hurts of life, to the stress of life. That's why God said, cast all of your care over onto me. Because he didn't make you that way. But this morning, I believe that God is going to do something significant in your life. I believe that God, I believe, I believe there's going to be divine transfer this morning. It's going to be a, there's going to be a, a trade-off this morning. He's going to take your pain and give you his purpose. He's going to take your hurt and give you his healing this morning. And this is a starting point of recovery today. This is a starting point. There may be tears to cry, tears left to be shed, conversations that have to be had, but you're gonna be strengthened like you've never been strengthened before. And you're gonna have the peace of God. I wanna pray with you. Church, would you stretch forth your hands and say worship and as we pray together, let's let God move in their lives. See, today is significant. Every one of you that we prayed for, listen, God has started something. There's always a ground zero for what, when God is doing something. There's always a starting point. And I believe that there are, listen to me, I believe there are miracle days ahead. Miracle days. There, there are going to be days, listen, miracles come in all shapes and sizes. A miracle is simply God interrupting our life. A miracle, a miracle is God invading our life. And there, I'm just saying this from my spirit. I believe it with all of my heart. There are miracle days ahead. There are miracle days ahead. There's, there's going to be an invasion from heaven into your life. I believe that. I believe that. Those of you that are watching online, listen, that's why I encourage you at the beginning of this service, don't get comfortable. Stir yourself. There are miracle days. There's an invasion from heaven. When it feels like everything retreated, God was just getting everything ready and put into place. 
It's going to be an invasion of heaven. Listen, I made a decision. I choose. I want to live my life more on the supernatural side than the natural side. You say, Pastor, people will think you're crazy. Man, they've thought that for a long time. Amen. Let's just prove them right. I, I'd rather walk and trust God. Let me give you a word. I, I had a word for someone that was down here, but I want to share it with all of you. Many of us have tried to do more than what was required of us. That means we've tried to take it on ourselves when the only thing God asked of us is to trust Him. Amen. Come on, put your faith in God. Put your faith in God. Amen. Guys, we love you this morning. You can be seated. God bless you.